Let's fire this up. I wanted to show you what's happening right now at CERN. Unfortunately, the answer is not very exciting. No beam in the LHC until tomorrow morning at about 9 o'clock. So I was going to show you events that are coming in as we speak with beautiful proton-proton collisions, but there are none to show you that are happening right now. So we go to the talk about stuff that happened previously. As Brent said, the work is going on at the CERN laboratory. And the one of the projects at the CERN laboratory is the Large Hadron Collider. And the Large Hadron Collider project has several different experiments associated with it. Uh, this time I'm going to minimize the amount of gee whiz stuff about the Large Hadron Collider, but I will remind you that it's a round machine, about 27 kilometers around, and the main idea is to put beams of protons into the two beam pipes that go in opposite directions, and at certain selected locations those beams are focused to a small area so that the protons can collide. At some times, for some periods, uh, lead ions, completely ionized lead atoms, are used instead of protons to study more nuclear physics kind of things. But I haven't uh, prepared anything about those results. Most of the year is spent running with protons. Here's a little map showing the layout. The main CERN laboratory is down here, the thing that was set aside in the 1950s, but they've uh, expanded as the accelerators got bigger to annex this little region in France. So this is the border between Switzerland and France. Switzerland is down here and France is up here. And most of the LHC, is, which is this big blue thing, is in France. It crosses the border a few times on its way around. And point five is the location of the CMS experiment. Atlas is the other big experiment that's at point one, right across the street from CERN, very convenient for them. And there are a couple of other experiments, which are major experiments also, but they have different focuses, different objectives, and Atlas and CMS are the ones that are kind of general purpose and directly competing with one another to keep each other honest, to promote the highest quality of results. This is a sketch about the accelerator complex at CERN. And it shows, uh, well, the protons in the LHC start in the linear accelerator 2. They visit the booster. They visit the proton synchrotron, which has been around for 50 years. And they visit the super proton synchrotron. And then they are injected into the LHC. The energy is increased at each stage. The energy of the LHC is limited by the ability to bend the protons around that 27 kilometer circumference circle. If we could make stronger magnets, we would increase the energy of the protons even more. But the best they could come up with are these guys right here. This is one of 1,200 bend magnets that are in the LHC. They're about 14 plus meters long each. And here's what they look like inside. The two vacuum pipes where the proton beams travel are there. And here are the superconducting windings. And there's a system of liquid helium at 1.9 kelvins that keeps the system superconducting. And a lot of effort to thermally insulate that. So you don't have to pay the electricity bill to run conventional magnets all day long with incredible magnetic fields, but you have to pay the bill to run the refrigerators to keep this thing cold. It's the world's largest ultra-high vacuum system and the world's largest cryogenic system and the world's largest particle accelerator. And here's what it looks like downstairs with these big blue cans just one after another. Those are the bend magnets. There are also thousands of other magnets involved in focusing and steering the beams to keep them well behaved.
Now in physics 2210, we haven't learned about this energy unit yet, but we've learned about joules. And in my talk, I use energy units that are related to the electron volt, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. It's the amount of kinetic energy an electron acquires when it falls across a one volt potential difference. But the units that we want to talk about are, that are more convenient for our job are the GeV, a giga electron volt, and the TeV, which is getting into the erg region. For those of you who know about ergs, it's 160 nanojoules. There's a approach between the microscopic and macroscopic worlds here. The LHC was supposed to be running a long time ago, and the first beams were successfully guided around the machine in 2008. And then on September 19th, 2008, there was the incident, which was a catastrophe in which a bad solder joint between the superconducting uh, conductors between two magnets uh, led to damage of the beam pipe, release of liquid helium, uh, widespread destruction by mechanical means as the magnets were ripped off of the concrete floor and bent and thrown around, and destruction of, uh, uh, of the vacuum pipe inside. When uh, soot and junk got inside, several kilometers worth of vac vacuum pipe was messed up and they had to use a little brush to clean these several kilometers of pipe and they had to take out and fix 50 giant magnets and it took a year, more than a year, to get things hooked up again. And they realized that there were a few other um, connections between the magnets that were suspect and they decided not to put the same amount of current in those things that they had originally put and they were planning to put. So if the magnets are powered up with less current, they will bend the protons less and you'll have to have smaller proton energy until you can get that sorted out. It takes months just to warm up the machine and fix one thing and cool it back down again. So you don't want to do that. And so they decided we're going to do an analysis of the connections that we can make without warming up the whole accelerator and decide what would be the safe upper limit for the collision energies. And the answer was 7 TeV. The design was to have two beams of protons, each proton with 7 TeV for a total collision energy of 14. And they decided to go with half that for the time being. So we are running now with 3.5 TeV proton energies for a total collision energy of 7. That started in March of 2010. From March through the fall, there were proton-proton collisions and the performance was awesome. The machine worked, oh I've got this in between, let's talk about this now. I'll come to the awesome performance. The protons don't travel around in a continuous stream. They are grouped together in bunches that are sort of this long, that are spaced apart by about 50 feet. Each bunch has about 100 billion protons, and so far they've filled 1,380 of these bunch locations that are available around the LHC. The plan ultimately is to have 2,800 bunches going in each direction. The reason you want bunches is so that you can control where the collisions will happen. If you have a stream of protons going willy-nilly through, they could collide at any point along the ring, but if they arrive together in bunches, you know there's going to be a collision here and now and not a lot of other places. So there are these little moments when a collision is possible and the locations of these collisions are arranged to be in the center of a detector. And that's the one spot where you have to focus the particles down to the smallest possible area. Once you put the protons in, you accelerate them from 
it turns out to be 450 GeV as the output energy of the previous accelerator, 450 GeV up to 3500 GeV, or hopefully later to a higher energy, and then they can coast for 10 hours or more. Even though you're trying to make them collide with each other and you're pretty successful, there's still so many protons in there that they last for hours. The bunch spacing is 50 nanoseconds. Uh, in order to fit the 2800 bunches, they will have to be 25 nanoseconds. And one nanosecond is one foot at the speed of light. So the detector has to think about what just happened, and it's got 50 nanoseconds before the next thing is going to happen. And it has to decide quickly if it wants to save the event. We can't save every collision. We, we can save only a small fraction of them for practical purposes of storing the data and processing the data. There needs to be some kind of a system to filter out the less interesting events and save the good ones, whatever that means. Come to the point where the bunches of protons have so many protons in them and they're focused so in such a small area that when one pair of bunches cross each other, there are something like 10 or 20 proton-proton collisions happening. This is not like the old days, where you'd have bunch crossing after bunch crossing, and nothing would happen, and then, oh, there's one. That was the way my previous experiment was, with electrons and positrons colliding. Now you get 10 or 20, and almost all of those collisions are of a non-interesting variety where the protons just kind of break apart and make a splatter in the detector, and you don't make any Higgs bosons, you don't make any top quarks. It's, it's not that exciting. Uh, I'm coming to that. Yeah. Uh, no, that's a, an act. Yes, it is by chance. That's, there's no connection. The speed is the speed of light, no matter what the energy is. And the spacing is just for practical purposes. Uh, 25 is really challenging for the detectors, so they started with 50. So they could go up to the maximum energy design. Absolutely. They can have. They could just have one pair of bunches in the machine if they wanted to, and that's indeed how they started out. The, the plan was to start with a simple and less lethal amount of protons in the machine, because when the thing is fully stoked up to the design, the amount of energy in those protons is like I showed you in some other talk like a, a train going in each direction, a big, super fast train. Uh, so it's uh, not to fool around with, and they wanted to make sure they had things under control, so they increased the number of bunches gradually over the months of 2010 and 2011. Now, let me talk about uh, how we measure the output of the LHC, I guess you would say. And in order to explain that, first I want to talk about a concept called cross-section. If you want to have two protons collide and produce a Higgs boson or produce top quarks or produce anything, you could figure out what is the effective area of the target on the one proton that the other proton has to hit. It's not really like that, of course, in quantum mechanics. It's a probability kind of a thing and the actual air, uh, size of a proton doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the effective area of the target you have to hit in order to get one kind of result or the other. But we use this symbol sigma to stand for the cross-section, and it is measured in units of area. And just to give you an, one example, I put down the cross-section for, it's called total inelastic PP cross-section. That means what is the cross-section, the effective target area, just to make the protons break up somehow, so that after the collision you don't have two protons anymore. And it turns out to be 
Well, we use these units of barns, as in the side of a barn is the area we're trying to hit. 60 millibarns is the total PP cross-section, and one barn is 10 to the minus 28 square meters. Yeah, <laughs> when you collide those uh, lead nuclei, I forgot what the number is, but it's more than a barn of cross-section. It's just unfathomable for a, pro a particle physicist because the interesting cross-sections are picobarns, as you will see. Now, okay, so that's <clears throat> one half of the equation. The other half of the equation, what can the LHC do to make a lot of collisions? Well, it can have lots of protons. It can squeeze them down into a small area, and it can have them come around and around a lot of times. We can just wait a long time. So the combination of those three things, number of protons, how big an area they are squeezed into, and how many times they encounter each other, can be put together into a quantity called integrated luminosity. This is a measure of how much data we collect or how much potential data the LHC has provided to us, how many possible collisions. It's measurement of how many collision opportunities there were. Such that the number of collisions that actually occurs is equal to the cross-section times the integrated luminosity. The cross-section is an area, so this integrated luminosity thing has to be an inverse area quantity, which is a bit odd but the product has to be a number of collisions, like 12, so there's no escaping this conclusion. The integrated luminosity is an inverse area. So you could do inverse barns for convenience. Well, inverse barn is a tiny amount of data, and so this is kind of funny. An inverse pico barn is a lot more data than an inverse barn because it's inverse pico. It's like 10 to the 12 inverse barns. And you have to get used to this. In 2010, the amount of collisions that the LHC provided in the CMS experiment with a CMS detector working properly, at least at some level, able to record the collisions was 43 inverse pico barns, and everyone was ecstatic because the thing just kept working better than expected. The LHC kept working better than expected, and CMS worked just fine. High efficiency of data taking. A couple of weeks ago, in one fill that lasted something like 16 hours, we collected 113 inverse pico barns, three times as much as in the whole year before. We do that in one, one day now. And the total collected so far in 2011 is 4,000 inverse pico barns. So we had a, a dilemma that I've never experienced before. We collected this wonderful data in 2010, and the people go off and start writing wonderful papers describing the data from 2010. And before the paper is even finished being fussed with, We've got 20 times as much data as we had in that paper, and the paper is kind of worthless now, almost. <coughs> but we forged ahead and published as many of those as possible. Well, just for our silly numbers purposes, so far in 2011, there have been this many collisions happening inside the CMS detector, and the rate that we're up to now when things are working properly at the number of bunches we are using is 200 million collisions per second. So I should tell you more about the CMS experiment. It was built by 3,100 other people, not me, and it's a magnificent device for measuring what happens when protons collide. And here is a drawing of it. It's about 70 feet uh, along this way, 50 feet across. Here's a little person in the sketch. And the weight is 14,000 metric tons. It has more iron than the Eiffel Tower. And there are these layers of different types of detectors. 
surrounding the collision point, which is in the middle. And I want to talk more about this than I have in previous talks to explain a little more what's going on. So let me just point out the ones that I'm going to mention. This gray thing here is a coil, a superconducting solenoid. It has a huge current flowing and it's also kept at cryogenic temperature so that it will carry the current indefinitely with zero resistance. And it provides a big magnetic field inside there, which is good for analyzing the particles as I will mention. Inside of that coil, there are hadronic calorimeter, electromagnetic calorimeter, and central detector, so-called. And outside of the coil is all this stuff. Muon chambers are the orange things, and the yellow stuff is called return yolk. That's where the iron is. The magnetic field produced by the solenoid, let's say it comes out this way, and somehow the field lines need to loop around, and this iron stuff uh, allows a path for the magnetic field lines to loop around, and we get to actually use the magnetic field twice, because when particles called muons pass through here, they bend in the opposite direction to the way they were bending in the inner detector, and it's kind of nifty. Here's a photograph during the assembly of the CMS experiment. There's the barrel part, and then there are two end cap pieces that plug into the ends. And those end caps are not visible here. They're not in the picture. This is the barrel showing the muon detectors and the return yoke iron. And the coil, superconducting coil, is in here somewhere. And then the inner detector, the calorimeters and things are inserted in there. Here's some people standing around admiring it as this part is being inserted into the center. Okay, here's my obligatory slide. I don't think I've ever given a talk where I didn't show this about what are the elementary particles. I have to remind you, we currently believe that all of matter is made of six types of quarks and six types of leptons. Electrons are here on the list as elementary particles, but protons and neutrons are not. They're made out of quarks. They're made out of up and down quarks. Here, there's nothing pretty much except electrons and up and down quarks. But there are lots of other things that can be uh, produced. Oh, neutrinos. There are floods of neutrinos passing through the room, uh, but right out the other side, coming from the sun and from other places. No. <laughs> I don't think so. And these other things we can produce in our experiments, and if we want to study them, we're going to have to produce them because they're not sitting here right now. And these particles are responsible for transmitting the forces or the interactions between the matter particles. The photon for the electromagnetic interaction, the gluon carries the strong force, and the Z and the W carry the weak interaction. All of these kinds of quarks and leptons have an antimatter version, and we make those routinely because when you make a matter particle, you're pretty much obliged to make the corresponding antimatter version, and so we do that all the time. We've been doing that for decades. When the protons collide in CMS, there's a cornucopia of different types of particles that are produced. If you look in the particle data book, you see the dozens of types of particles that exist, and pretty much we can make them all in the collisions, but almost all of them are unstable. They either decay in the first 10 to the minus 18 meters before they leave the collision point, or they decay in the first few millimeters if they're really long-lived. But only a select group will actually leave the vacuum pipe and come into the detector. These are the ones that come into the detector. I can make a small list which covers them all. The neutrinos are not on the list. They come into the detector and they go out the other side and we don't observe them the chances of observing one are extremely small and we would never be able to tell that that's what it was because of all the other stuff going on. Among the charged particles, 
there are electrons and anti-electrons called positrons, muons, pions, kaons, and protons and antiprotons is what that's supposed to stand for. Those are charged, and these guys, it's supposed to say neutral here. The photons, or gamma rays, there's a kind of quark-containing particle called a kaon that comes into the detector, and there's uh, neutrons that come into the detector. I guess there are a few other obscure things at a low probability, but mainly this is the stuff that's actually being detected directly. So we would like to try to distinguish them from one another, as well as measure their direction and momentum and energy and so forth. So now let me uh, list the features of the CMS detector. Here's the superconducting solenoid. The magnetic field inside there is 3.8 Teslas. It's quite a strong field. And then comes the tracking detector. It's made out of silicon wafers, which have different uh, structures etched on them. In your CCD chip for your uh, video recorder, you have a pixel detector. And we have 1,400 of those little wafers arranged in a barrel shape around the collision point. And I think we have end flat structures as well. Not sure about that. And then 15,000 silicon wafers that have a strip geometry rather than pixel geometry. The total area of silicon wafers is 200 square meters. It's like a tennis court of silicon wafers. Yo! How many individual pixels? Uh, and I oh my gosh. Uh, strips as well. Uh, I could, I'd have to look that up, but it's, it must be an unbelievable number of pixels. And the I know you get insane resolution, resolution like, uh, you know, Benson resolution. Um, like that. It's at uh, the 5 or 10 micrometer resolution. Oh, yeah, that's pretty good. No, it's not. The, the wafers can record where on the wafer the particle has gone through because of which pixel or which strips have registered a little signal. When the charged particle goes through the wafer, it ionizes the material or it releases electrons and holes, if you want to think in a semiconductor kind of way, and those are detected by the uh, attached electronics, amplified and detected, and all the information is somehow kept organized so that you can go back and tell on which wafer, at which location the particle has come through. That's what the central part of the detector contains. Surrounding that is the electromagnetic calorimeter. Now in thermodynamics kind of uh, lessons we learn about calorimetry where you put a copper block at 40 degrees Celsius into a cup of water at 20 degrees Celsius and you look at the temperature increase of the water and you can figure out something about the copper. And it's not quite like that here, but the idea that all of the energy of the particle is being dumped into the apparatus is what this is referring to. So when particles enter the electromagnetic calorimeter, if they are electrons or gamma rays in particular, they deposit their energy. And we measure the amount of energy not with a thermometer, but with light detectors. They, the calorimeter consists of very exotic crystals. I think they're something like this big made out of lead tungstate. It's clear, it's beautiful, and it's made out of two different kinds of metal. And when a charged particle goes through, it emits a little bit of light, and photodetectors are attached on the end of the crystal to record how much light and when. And this is used to infer the energy of the electrons and photons that have hit the calorimeter. On the outside of that is the hadron or hadronic calorimeter, which is less exotic, but it contains brass plates. The idea of the lead tungstate is it's very dense, and you can, in a relatively small amount of depth, get the entire gamma ray energy to be deposited. You don't want some of the energy going out the other side, and you don't want to make a bigger crystal, and then a bigger detector on the outside. It's already big enough. so. That's why they went for this exotic material to have as, uh, as shallow a calorimeter as possible to do the job. 
So behind that, they're again trying to stop all the particles that have survived the electromagnetic calorimeter. So things like pions and kaons and protons, and the neutrons and the k-zeros that have come to this point, depositing little energy in the electromagnetic calorimeter, will now hopefully deposit everything they've got in the hadron calorimeter. And in between plates of brass are plastic scintillators, which also emit a little flash of light when charged particles go through. And from the amount of light, we infer the energy that was deposited. And on the outside of all of that, the muon detectors, they have several different kinds of, of technologies or, or arrangements of detectors. But the basic idea, again, is that muons will pass through all of that other stuff and through the coil and come out to the outer part of the detector where some chambers that have a special gas inside are located and the muons will ionize the gas and leave a little trail of ions and electrons that can be detected with electronic elements of different kinds and the total amount of surface they're stacked together to make a redundant system. There's six acres of detectors on the outside wrapped around the CMS. In summary then, here is the silicon detector, but this same arrangement is common in all kinds of particle experiments. Here's the silicon detector, here's the electromagnetic hadronic calorimeter and muon detectors. We can distinguish between different types of particles by seeing what their signature is in these. Photons, which are neutral, pass through the tracking chamber without a whisper unless by chance they interact with the tracking material. So, well, that's a detail we have to worry about. But they will deposit all of their energy in the electromagnetic calorimeter. Electrons or positrons would leave a track, but then deposit all their energy in the electromagnetic calorimeter. Muons leave a track everywhere, but a small amount of energy is deposited, and they continue through the muon detector and out the other side, out into the surrounding Earth. Particles made of quarks would leave a trail and then deposit everything in the hadron calorimeter. Neutrons don't leave a trail in here, and they probably would interact with the hadron calorimeter, and so on. Okay, we've come to the physics part. I wanted to say something that we've actually measured with CMS finally, now that we have all these papers coming out. So I have selected a few things that I have some familiarity with. I have worked on none of the measurements. I have read most of the papers and fixed the punctuation and the grammar and stuff. That was my main function over the past 12 months, has been helping with the writing of the papers. So the first topic is a, uh, an instance where we looked for something that we knew would be there, and it was there. It's the production of W and Z bosons. So I won't read this thing, but it reports, this is the front page of the paper where it reports the cross-section for producing W bosons and the cross-section for producing Z bosons. And I'll show you some pictures from the paper. This is from 36 inverse picobarns. This is from the 2010, the measly little 2010 data has these thousands of events. That's a times 10 to the 3 up there on the scale of these beautiful plots. And this is the same graph as this, except here the vertical scale is linear, and here the vertical scale is logarithmic. So there's a lot going on here. I'll try to explain. First of all, what is plotted? It's ET slash. In our detector, we detect the particles that have interacted, and we can sometimes notice that it doesn't balance. When two protons collide, you're not getting the entire proton colliding with the entire proton. You're getting one little piece of one guy colliding with one little piece of the other. But those pieces are pretty much going in opposite directions, and anything that's produced should have a total momentum of zero in this transverse plane. So 2210 students who haven't come to momentum yet, there should be, um, well, momentum is mass times velocity for low speed things. It's a vector. And 
if something goes flying off to the left, there should be something else flying off to the right. And we can, we can tell when there is an imbalance. And that's often caused by a neutrino. The neutrinos carry momentum and we don't detect it. So that would balance things out if we only knew about the neutrino. Well, when a W boson is produced and it decays into a muon and a neutrino, this is what we're looking for in this picture, you're going to see the muon go off one way and you're going to see nothing go off on the other side. And so this is a measurement of how much was missing. How much momentum was missing, really, even though it's called E, it's really standing for momentum. And the W boson has a mass of about 80 GeV, and so about half of that energy is going to be missing, but it depends from one event to the next what the exact value is that the neutrino carried away. The yellow stuff shows the expected shape of the distribution from W decaying to mu nu, and then the purple and orange and red show the background expected from other things that we're not trying to measure, like TT bar, so top anti-top events. And QCD means uh, these mundane events where there's just a lot of uh, jets produced which are made from quarks or gluons, but they're not special events. And you can see there's a huge significant signal above the background and we figure out how much background there is and we correct for it to get the cross-section. This picture is from the same paper showing the Z production. When the Z decays, one of the ways it can decay is to E plus, E minus, electron, positron. And you see both of those. There's nothing missing. And if you see the two electrons and you measure their energy and their momenta, you can do a little calculation to figure out what would have been the mass of the object that decayed into E plus E minus, and that's the quantity that's graphed here, and there's a giant spike right at the mass of 91 GeV, which is the mass of the Z boson. So when you see a peak at 91, it means you're making Zs, and you can see how tiny the background is because our detector is working great and was designed cleverly by the people who designed it. The next physics topic I've selected is a case where we didn't see something. It is called search for large extra dimensions in the diphoton final state. Diphoton means events that contain two gamma rays. Apparently there are some guys who had the idea that maybe space has more than three dimensions and their motivation for proposing this, well, it's sort of talked about here, but it's not going to be possible for me to explain. This is the introduction of the paper. Uh, in a nutshell, they're concerned about the vastly different scales of uh, phenomena in the standard model. Um, I can't even begin to explain what this is. Anyway, they're very concerned about how it is that a reasonable kind of model can make a prediction that one phenomenon would happen at this kind of energy and a different phenomenon happens at this other energy which is 15 orders of magnitude different. They have this prejudice that numbers like 10 to the 15 just can't appear in the official plan of the universe. I don't know if I agree with that, but anyway, the proposal is that the gravitational force penetrates through more than three dimensions, because there are more than three dimensions, but the other forces only reach through the three-dimensional space that we're familiar with somehow. And so they have formulas and their parameters, and we look for the signature of this, which is events that contain two photons, which come from the decay of these so-called Kaluza-Klein gravitons. If their theory is right, then there would be these graviton particles, which are very massive and would decay into two photons. So we looked for events with two photons, and here is the mass of the parent particle that would have decayed into these two photons. 
here are the number of events, and the black dots show the data, and here it's petering out to one event per bin, and there's a couple of events. And if this model were true, we might see events way out here, and we see nothing out there. So we excluded this model for certain ranges of parameters and certain numbers of extra dimensions. Finally, let me say a word about the Higgs search. The search for the standard model Higgs boson. This was in the news in the summertime when a new wave of results were reported by LHC experiments, CMS and ATLAS. Introduction to the Higgs boson, the proposal, to, the proposal that there is a Higgs boson is motivated by an attempt to explain what mass is. The scenario is that a particle has mass by virtue of it slogging through this hypothetical Higgs field that fills the universe. And if there is a Higgs field, there would be particles of the Higgs field called Higgs particles or Higgs bosons, just like photons are particles of the electromagnetic field. Well, we don't know if this is true at all. If it's true, we don't know what the mass of the Higgs bosons would be, but if we saw a Higgs boson, we would know there is a Higgs field. So we're scanning all possible Higgs boson masses, and this is a plot showing different ways, different uh, combinations of like two quarks or two gluons, these little springs or gluons that are inside of the protons that collide together to make a Higgs. Different ways Higgses can be produced. And the cross-section in picobarns, when the center of mass energy is up to 14 TeV, for different Higgs boson masses. The cross-section is small. It's a picobarn or 10 or less than one. It's hard to observe this. We would look for any possible uh, way of producing them we could find. And then once you produce a Higgs boson, it decays, and you need to adjust your search to match what they decay into. And it's very complicated because, depending on the mass of the Higgs boson, it would decay into different things. If the Higgs boson is up here at 300 GeV, then the Higgs decays mostly into W plus, W minus, with a little bit of Z0, Z0. But if the Higgs mass is down here at 100 GeV, then it decays almost all the time into BB bar. So you've got to be ready for any combination of, of parameters, any scenario. And so the Higgs hunters have a big job, and there is an army of people on CMS looking for the Higgs in every possible scenario. Have we excluded a bunch of uh, BB bar energies? So BB bar. Uh, up to 114 GeV was excluded at the old round of experiments, uh, like Aleph, the one that I was on. Uh, but a tantalizing hint of a signal was seen. Yeah. But that turns out to be the hardest spot for the LHC experiments to search now. So other things are being excluded first. Well, this picture is just to show you the list of all the possible Higgs decay modes and the mass ranges that they are relevant to, that the CMS experiment has already done, and the different amounts of data that were used. I mean, uh, the people are updating as new data is collected. And here are some real events which are candidates for Higgses, but, but we don't see more than the background in any significant way. This is, excuse me, this is an event that has four electrons. So you could have a Z, <coughs> A Higgs decaying into ZZ, and each Z decaying into EE. So you get four electrons. But you can get pairs of Zs produced without a Higgs, too. So it could just be background. And it shows you the tracks seen in the central tracking detector. The red things come from the electromagnetic calorimeter, and the blue things come from the hadron calorimeter, I believe. Uh, here's another event a possible Higgs event. This is what muons look like. They go off and they're detected again and again out here in the muon system. And these are two electrons here. So this could be 
a Higgs decaying into ZZ and one Z decayed into EE and one Z decayed into mu mu. But this could happen without the assistance of a Higgs as well. As a summary, combining all of the results of all of the different Higgs searches from CMS and what is, what is plotted here is somehow some kind of a confidence level assuming that there is a Higgs boson present for different Higgs boson masses. The thing that you're supposed to get from this without a full explanation is that this red line is located in a place that corresponds to 95 percent confidence level exclusion of the Higgs boson and these black squares are our measurements. So anywhere the black square is below the red line we exclude at 95 percent confidence level the Higgs of that mass. Down here there's a region where we don't exclude. That's the 110 to 150 area. And then there are little places where it pokes up and down. So we're excluding this very thoroughly. We're excluding this very thoroughly. But over here we maybe have a little bit, a, a little bit too many events for background. So maybe this Higgs is going to pop up in here. In the media was reported that the LHC experiments have looked for the Higgs and they haven't found it and it's pretty much ruled out now. Well, that's hogwash because there's still plenty of places it can be. It can be way up here, no problem. And this is just one, the simplest possible model that has a Higgs in it. And there's a bunch of different models which are not excluded at all or only partially excluded by our results. The last page. Next year, well, we're still running. We're going to do a few weeks of lead lead collisions too this fall. And next year, we're going to have an even higher collision rate as they put more bunches into the LHC. We might go up to 8 TeV instead of 7. And then there will be a shutdown for a couple of years where every connection will be checked. The thing we brought up to room temperature, every connection will be checked and we will then go for 14 TeV or maybe 13 or 13 and a half, whatever they think is prudent when it's all been checked out. And this could go on for 15 more years as the accelerator and the detectors are upgraded to produce higher and higher collision rates. Thank you very much. Within the experiment, there are a dozen groups of uh, different physics domains that are organized. They each have their own uh, group leaders. And then there's a, a, a management level above that. And so when some people want to do some analysis, it has to be agreed within their group, the, the relevant group for that topic. And if it's made official that, yes, CMS is going to do this, then they're, you know, they're encouraged and provided with the resources of computing that they need. And there's billions of simulated events that are produced uh, in order to predict the backgrounds and things like that. So they get what they need and they do the result and they come back and they write a report about it. They show it to the whole collaboration and it gets approved and then they can start making a paper and stuff like that. Yeah, there was a search about extra dimensions for gravitons and uh, experimental data have pointed that what, to what is most likely pointed, to two extra dimensions or to five extra dimensions or it did not uh, so discriminate between the two? The model comes with free parameters. Uh -huh. So we can't say the whole model is wrong. We can't exclude the whole model, but we can exclude uh, the model for a certain range of these parameters. So the, res the results are reported in the form, if there are two extra dimensions, then this parameter can't be less than so many TeV, and if there are three extra dimensions, then it can't be less than that. That's the way it's reported. Um, what was the 
What about uh, stuff like the extended standard model and things that allow for T violations? Are there are there energies where we would expect to find the Higgs boson that negates those models, or or is it a lot more wide open there? I'm not aware of any. Uh, I'm not aware. That's all I'm saying of any connection between uh, what you just said and the Higgs searches. Yeah, you extend the Higgs boson on experiment to find uh, uh, the relationship to, to symmetry. Well, if they find basic.